Welcome, uh, everyone. Just to warn you, we are being live streamed, so the back, if you're in the first two rows, the back of your heads will be visible uh, across the planet. If you're uncomfortable with that, it'd be time to move. This would be a good time to go somewhere else. Uh, the Q&A will also be live streamed. If you're asking questions, you're going to appear uh, on that as well. I always have to do an introduction to the Library of Mistakes because most people don't really know what it is or how it works, so it's a free public library. We are open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday to Saturday. Uh, and if you'd like to come here, register as a reader on our website, libraryofmistakes.com, and then you arrange a visit. It's an unmanned library, so you'll come to the back door, and we will know when you're there, and you will buzz, and we can buzz you in and let you in remotely. It's a pretty impressive bit of technology, because two weeks ago, from a Vaporetto in the middle of the Grand Canal in Venice, I let somebody into this library. So <laughs> the, world, uh, the world has moved on. So that's how you join the library. That's how you get into the library. Uh, also, we have the videos, and there's a whole host now of previous videos that we've recorded. You'll find them on the website. This will be recorded, and then next week sometime, or end of this week, you'll find that on the website. And we have podcasts, six of them, soon to be seven of them, uh, and they're available on all the usual podcast services. So we're uh, kind of expanding pretty rapidly. Uh, we're trying to keep up with the supply of mistakes. It's pretty tough, but we're uh, doing our very best. Uh, well, this is, uh, we're doing this in conjunction with the CFA Society. The, all of you will know who the CFA Society is, and this is our second event in conjunction with them, so we're delighted to be doing that. Uh, if you are a member of the CFA and would like CPD points for tonight's event, you have to sign this piece of paper, which will be available just over there, and you just um, you know, tick, tick your name on the way out, and then you will be accredited with, uh, with CPD points. Uh, and now I have to introduce our speaker to everybody who already knows him, which is kind of a bit peculiar. But to those watching online who don't know who our speaker is, his name is Sandy Nairn of Edinburgh Partners and Templeton Global Investors and a director of uh, Got Global Opportunities Trust, the new name for the Opportunities Trust. Sandy has been in financial markets uh, for over 30 years now. This is not his first book. Uh, there's a fantastic, his first book is a fantastic book called Engines That Move Markets. I say that because it's a financial history book in particular. Um, there's tons of research in it and highly recommended. There have been others since then, uh, mainly focusing on the work of Sir John Templeton and what we can learn from Sir John Templeton. But this book is a forward-looking book, I think, isn't it, on the uh, what's going to happen next, which are the most dangerous types of book you can possibly write. <laughs> but Sandy has taken it upon himself to write one. So what we're, what's going to happen is Sandy will talk for 20 minutes or so about this wonderful book, The End of the Everything Bubble. Uh, but tonight's speech will be the end of the everything bubble and its aftermath. Uh, and when he's finished, we will discuss uh, the bubble, the aftermath, and then we'll throw it open to the audience for all of you uh, to ask questions. So that's the format for this evening. Sandy, over to you. Am I switched on? Uh, uh, well, generally or just on this microphone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, what's that? Yeah, you are now switched on. Nice I'll switch, switch on. off. Thanks, Russell. Um, so uh, originally I thought we, Russell and I were just going to have a conversation and he'd sort of tear strips off me or agree or disagree. And, and he said, look, stand up and speak for 20 minutes. And, um, and that's fine. And I, I tried to think, well, what, what is it that's actually interesting? Because a lot of the stuff that's in the book, I, I, I think, has already begun to unfold in the past six or nine, six or nine months. Um, we had great fun with the title. Um, I, Russell mentioned the first book I did was when I was living in Florida and the, the TMT and all that stuff was, was going on. And, um, and, and, and this book falls into the, the, the kind of same line of thinking as the previous one. It, when something extreme seems to be happening, it, it's very easy to kind of fall into some sort of trite explanations of, oh, well, everything's expensive or you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but it's not entirely helpful um, because it's entirely possible that you could be wrong, but if it's something of a large magnitude, I think you feel the need to try and explore um, all the elements of it. And, and you, if you haven't realised it before you start, you realise just how little you do know as you work your way towards the, the conclusions or the questions that are around in the market at, at the time. 
um, I, the first book on technology, I got, um, got a bit carried away with it. And my wife did say, if I ever do this again, I'll get divorced. So anything I've written since then has been done without mentioning it um, at all. Um, but the, the purpose of it is, is actually not to write a book, it's to help, you, to help me try and understand and think, have I explored everything properly? Because if the original contention and valuation is correct, you're going to have to do something pretty radical on the other side of it. And you don't want to be going down that road if you haven't actually explored all the different avenues. And so, like all these things, you quickly realise how much harder you need to work in certain areas, um, which, which is an interesting journey as well. But the other thing about it that I found extremely helpful is, it is once you have worked it through, um, you're in a much stronger position uh, emotionally and mentally to take the steps you have to take. Because those steps are, you know, I, I don't underestimate how difficult they are to actually follow if markets are in extreme, uh, an extreme position. Uh, and for me, I mean, um, you know, writing I find very difficult. Um, it's, and you know, D David will, will know this given his part of his career in writing. It, it's, it's just hard, and obviously Russell, the same thing. It's, it's hard, it, it ex not just exposes your lack of knowledge, but it also exposes flaws in your logic. Um, Verbally, it's quite, you can get away with it. You, you can sort of wave your hands and talk and show some graphs. And then when you start to write it down, it, um, the issues sort of become apparent. So that, that's the reason for these things. And, and th they come out periodically when it, there's a large itch that requires to be, um, requires to be uh, scratched. So, um, which brings us to, to this book. Um, in, in some ways, it was interesting to write but not that interesting because it, it seemed to me and still does that um, the level of excess valuation markets wasn't really the question um, and, and if you speak to fellow investment professionals there's not many of them well they, they wouldn't start off by saying markets are cheap they might hover around by oh, well, they're okay value or mm, they might be a bit stretched um, you know, given self-preservation in your employment, it's unusual to say they're hideously overvalued um, and, and it's not your strongest marketing tool to potential clients. Um, but nevertheless, um, and every market you looked at looked to be the same. And, and so the, this was, the book was a bit of a kind of um, journey of exploration of, you know, how did we get there and where are the valuations? And, the how we get there, I think every, I, I almost hesitate to go through it because I think everybody knows it, but um, you know, to set the, the stage for conversations and discussions afterwards, it's, it's almost like the, the aftermath of any problem sets the stage for the next one. And so the financial crisis came, and we, we know the reasons you know, why it did. Um, the aftermath was an understandable reaction led by people like Ben Bernanke, who studied the Great Depression and they knew all the mistakes that had been made and they vowed not to make them again and, and they quite successfully managed to not make them again. Um, and I'm kind of fast forwarding through this, but I think the key that got us to where we got to was the inflation dog that didn't bark. Because if you remember back at the time when the financial crisis hit and we went down the road of monetary expansion, not so much on the fiscal side, but primarily monetary expansion, the, the kind of um, area of economics, and particularly on the monetary side, was saying, well, this is only going to lead to, to inflation, uh, and it didn't. And there's a whole bunch of reasons which we can explore why it didn't, but what was happening in the banks was probably the largest one in terms of the, the accelerator and, um, and break being pressed at the, the same time, which meant that you didn't get the the expansions that tend to go with it. And you know, some may agree with that, some may, may disagree, but the main point is inflation didn't come. So, so now you've got the biggest free lunch in history. Um, I, as a government, um, as a central banker, although not that I ideologically want to go this way, but um, or I, as somebody who pervades fiscal policy, definitely wants to go this way because I can now promise the electorate anything and I don't have to pay for it because the central banks, I'm basically printing money and spending it, and that makes me very popular. And if there's no inflationary response, you know, eventually whatever breaks or where just come off, um, come off completely. So if you look at the U.S. experience, um, financial crisis, one trillion of debt on the Fed balance sheet um, prior to it. 
then it goes to two trillion, then you have the taper tantrum and it goes to four trillion, then you have COVID and it goes to eight trillion. And, and so what's the context of those numbers? That's 40% of GDP sitting on the balance sheet of your central bank. Um, the original um, argument for going down this road uh, was, was, I think, perfectly reasonable. Um, because of the financial crisis, the banks have gone into lockdown. Lending has stopped, or if it's not stopped, it's been severely curtailed. We need to free that up. And the way we're going to do it, and, and they explicitly stated, like on the, the, the Bank of England website, but it was explicitly stated, was we want to push people out the risk curve. You know, so we, we, we make it that sovereign debt, an instrument that's not interesting to you in terms of providing income, and then you'll go out and buy things with slightly more risk, and that will free up, um, you know, free up lending, free up the economy, take some of the risk away, uh, and we can all move on fr from that. Um, and in a sense, it was very successful on the banks over the time, recapitalized, but it didn't stop. <laughs> it, you know, that bandwagon kept, kept going. Um, and then the next part of this for me, and it, it, it wasn't just this, but when we had the taper tantrum, if you, if you remember when um, the Fed started to kind of pull the, pull the horns back in a little bit, um, the, the toys came out of the pram. Um, and as the toys came out of the pram, it all started again. So what that said to markets was, it, this is not a Greenspan put, this is the greatest put of all time. They're telling us assets are only going to go up and they're never going to go down. Um, so if you create a framework for markets where the cost of money in real terms is zero or negative, and you're effectively being communicated that assets don't go down, you, you can write the story of how everything got to where it, where it got to. And obviously, it's more complicated and elaborate, but to me, that's the, 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 simple, the simple explanation. So you have... Um, the central bank said we want more risk. Well, they got it. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of it. Um, leverage, because the cost of debt is zero or negative, has, has gone through the roof. Um, and you've ended up in a position now where governments are more indebted than at any point in history. And then if you see the, um, the statement from the, the chief economist at um, the Bank of England, that depending on how many centuries you want to go, that interest rates were at 8,000 year low. You know, this, this is the context. It's not like a little bit of cyclical. This is something we haven't seen before. And then you layer on top of that, for me, um, we've had the longest bond bull market in history, um, stemming from the Volcker era. And there's been lots of supportive factors for the global economy. The demographics were supportive. Now they're not. Um, increase in trade was supportive. And now you need to have a debate about whether it's going to increase or whether going to go into trading blocks with all the geopolitics that you're, you're seeing. Um, migratory flows were positive, um, but populism has put a stop to that, or at least it's inhibited. Uh, global trade has topped out for all the same, um, for all the same reasons. And the, effici the efficiency gains in the production system that came from just-in-time manufacturing are now dual or triple source. So if you, if you were on a board of a large US corporate, or indeed probably anywhere, and you look at the dreaded risk matrices that you'll have to look at, one of them is going to be, what's your security of supply? Um, you, you cannot single source. And it started when you remember the floods in Indonesia when small component factories were flooded and entire production lines shut down as a consequence. Well, now you've got to layer onto that um, the geopolitics and security. So whether it's Huawei in China, you, you just th th there's a whole bunch of factors at play. So all of these elements um, are negative for growth in the global economy. And the final one that needs to be added on um, is global warming. And, and that, now, there's a school of thought that says alternative energy will make the world cheaper. I, I just can't see any evidence for that. Um, it, it, dealing with it might make the world survive longer, <laughs> um, but it's not, you know, if at, at its simplest level, I would say if you're going to take an unpriced externality and put it into the price, that makes prices go up, not down. Um, and, and I think that that is, you know, and in some ways, as an aside, the, the war in the Ukraine is not unhelpful, pushing energy prices up, because it, it will encourage um, switching over to non-carbon-based fuels because it makes them more competitive, and it also illustrates um, the supply chain and the geopolitical dangers, dangers with it. So that's what led us to where we are um, you know, how expensive are we? Well, you can take pretty much whatever measure of equities you want, and they're as high as they've, they've ever been. Um, the bond market, exactly the same thing. You look at, at real yields, they're at historic. 
either historic lows or bonds are at historic um, highs. And uh, Russ and I chatted just very briefly earlier today, and as he, he, Russell put it, you know, the chart either goes bottom left to top right or top right to bottom. Uh, sorry, top left to bottom right or bottom left to top right, depending on whether you're looking at prices or yields. Um, and, and you look at financial history books and you read um, accounts of what happened before um, the, great, the Wall Street crash. And there's all this talk about you know, shoeshine boys investing in this and lift operators investing in, in that. And we kind of laugh at it, saying, how stupid was that? Well, we have non-fungible tokens. We have cryptocurrencies. We have meme stocks. The list is as long as your arm of things, some of which have no intrinsic value whatsoever. Um, you know, my, my, not to personalize it, there are kids at my son's school trading in cryptocurrencies. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, human nature doesn't change and, and the reaction to something that looks like it never go down uh, doesn't change either. So that, that's where, where we got to. The second part of all of this was, well, you know, where could you be wrong? What could, what could get you out of this valuation problem? And clearly the only thing that can would be growth, um, economic growth. Well, we, we've got a number of inhibitors to that, but productivity is, is, well, I suppose productivity is economic growth. Can that do it? And the answer is the arithmetic doesn't work. You, you cannot get the arithmetic, in my mind, and, and this is now, some of the previous stuff I think was factual. This is just you know, pure opinion. Um, I can't see how productivity growth, it would be historically um, unusual, never been seen before to get the productivity growth required to get um, nominal GDP proof, so to get you to a point where you can underpin the valuations. That, that's not uh, making them cheap, that's just making them not absolutely um, decline. So, um, if, if all that is true, then asset prices are coming down and by a lot. And, and this is the bit that, you know, hopefully we can have a dialogue about when I um, round off, but that's the most interesting bit. I, I started writing more about that and, and there, was, there was too many forks in the road because it depends what the official reaction is. And, and I'm, you know, I, my judgment is no better than any of your judgment as to which government does what because the social contract between the population and the government is, is broken or will be broken because the economics of the fiscal position in governments, they can't afford to do what they're doing at the moment. So they're going to have to either raise taxes or cut um, or default on the debt. Um, and, and, and you can pick which government might do which one of these things, but um, it is an important thing to think through because you'll, if it's of the magnitude I think it is, you're going to get a political reaction to it. And that political reaction is, is obviously going to be important, as we've seen in Eastern Europe um, you know, recently. You can't, you can't ignore all of those, all of those things. So, so that was the kind of steps through, through the market. And um, I, put, I did, for the investment trust that Russell mentioned, I, um, I had to do a presentation, actually not on that, but it was built on one I had to do in Prague for various reasons, which I won't go into, I was asked to speak at the central bank and I had to follow the governor of the central bank who gave his inflation forecasts. Now, a central bank governor cannot give inflation forecasts that are out with the range he's charged to have in his job because he's not allowed to. <laughs> uh, and you could see he was a bit embarrassed. And I, oh, this is being recorded. Um, he, 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 gave a, a, he gave a very good, he did give a very good presentation and inflation was coming down, but it, it seemed to me, you know, that, that probably will happen. Um, I don't, I'm not a believer that inflation will stay where it is. I, I don't think the underlying rate is, I think it's maybe three, four, I don't know. We could debate, debate that. But that's all it needs to be to cause these problems in bond markets. The, the, um, the choke effect of coming out of um, COVID accounts for a lot of what we've seen, but not all of it. Um, the, the point was um, the cost of money had been determined not by the market, and it's had, all, it's had all these impacts, and it's been not determined by the market for 12 or 13 years. And so you've had all of these things unfold that we've, we've just described. I've only mentioned a few of them. Um, so what happens when, when this all comes down it is really by far the most interesting, difficult, and dangerous, dangerous question. Um, but anyway, the reason for mentioning that was that um, because it was Central Bank and it was their forecasting group, um, you try to start off with a quote, and um, I ended up sort of going down the rabbit hole of Yogi Berra quotes. So, so the, his famous one about forecasting was, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, which <laughs> isn't entirely true. But um, I got on to thinking about, you know, 
financial markets are staffed by really smart people. So how do we get to these positions? And the answer which I was kind of getting to or hinting at within the few words earlier was, we all act extremely rationally within what we believe the framework to be if it's going to be extended. So if the framework is markets are underwritten, the cost of money is zero, and it's going to extend indefinitely, everybody did exactly the thing you would expect. And that's correct until the point it isn't. I think we're past that point. We've now got a new framework coming. Um, and we need to be very careful because doing what you did before is, is now over and, and will, will not take you, in my mind, to the, to the right place. Um, and I thought about the behavioural bit and um, I then ended up in the medical <laughs> profession because I, I was thinking about, you know, you, you get addicted to these rules. They're not, they're not economic rules. They're, they're just the things you impose on it. So um, I, I went through the journals on the four stages of addiction. Um, so experimentation, regular use, dependency and tolerance, and then addiction. And I kind of, you know, tried to go back to the previous pe the period I think we're coming out of. And I said, well, that, that seems fair enough. But the one, the one that was more interesting is what happens when you come out of it. And it's called pause or post-acute withdrawal symptoms. Um, and this one I really liked. So there's um, six bullet points. One, can't sell, can't solve simple problems. Two, same thoughts keep repeating themselves. Three, mind goes blank. Four, can't concentrate for very long. Five, can't make mind up about what to do next. Six, and my favorite, make bad decisions even when I know better. Um, and I, I just think that, that that's where we are. And then what will happen next is there'll be a new framework and it'll be sensible and correct and then it'll probably be taken too far in the end. Um, so for... To, to conclude, if you like, what, um, what, what do I think that new framework will be? Well, I think, and this is not a value growth thing, I think I find the distinction trivial. I, I don't think it's helpful um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but I do think it will now be relentlessly fundamental. You know, where it was relentlessly thematic, now it's going to be relentlessly fundamental. Um, you cannot ignore the, mac the macro and the structural because it's going to play big roles in how it unfolds. You know, whether you think... And, and we'll have a debate with Russell about financial repression or not, or which government do, does what. Um, one point I think to remember is, is that for all those who believed that um, the internet only made things go up, uh, made prices go down, it actually speeds them going up because what it is is a better price discovery mechanism. And when it came in, there were all these market segments and the desegmentation caused average prices to fall but it's now an incredibly efficient transmission mechanism for making them go up. Um, so it, the, the internet was only deflationary for the period where market segmentation was removed in products. Once it's removed, it's simply a very efficient transmission mechanism. Um, and I think you need to understand the rules of the game have changed and, and think that through. And my final piece here was, and it's tortoises, not hares. It's very traditional in, in investing um, it's got nothing to do with value or growth. It's got to do with what you pay for what you get and the risks that sit around it, which then go back to the, the macro and, and structural framework. Um, and, and as Russell said, the, the trust that I'm, I'm now a director of, one of the reasons for going through this book was that we felt we had to change the investment policy of the trust. When it was originally set up, we gave it enough flexibility um, to be able to diversify into cash and so forth. But when you have an everything bubble, that policy is not sufficient. We needed greater flexibility to follow what you actually believe. And I know Russell has some thoughts on you know, the profession of fund management of um, how they approach investing for others relative to themselves. Um, and, and that's why that was, was done, because it's the only way to try and protect capital if this is correct. And um, I, I, have, I have no doubt on the excess valuation, but I'm not sure about is exactly how it unfolds. So I, I welcome any discussion and debate because um, it's not obvious and it will change. Russell. Sandy, thanks very much. My job is, because my job is really to be devil's advocate, I have to try and be optimistic now. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and as, as you know, that comes very, that comes very naturally to me. <laughs> uh, before we go on to the aftermath, when there's so much debt and when a bubble bursts, there's usually somewhere where it's with the, where the debt bit starts, where there are problems uh, meeting debt obligations 
none of them are jumping off the page at the minute, but given about debt in the system, it seems it's going to happen somewhere. So there's this great debt bubble. Where do you think, where do you think we're going to see that first crack appearing? Or maybe you see it. I, maybe I, I don't see it, but maybe it's already happening and I haven't picked it up. But is there a, is there a crack coming in the ability to service all this debt somewhere? Well, I, I suppose I've, um, although suffering yields have gone up a bit, they haven't really gone up that much and they're still historically low. So um, and I find it interesting when you, you, you watch commentators talking about it as if we're in an unusual position on yields, and we're not. Well, we, we are. They're low. Not, <laughs> not high, low. You know, they're still negative in real terms. So um, we, we haven't felt the full force of this yet, I think. But what I do think will happen is yield spreads will widen sharply within sovereigns from core to periphery, you know, to the, the, the more fragile economies, um, in corporates, according to risk, because they're still, although they've widened a bit, they're still too narrow, um, I think. The other thing uh, on this is that, um, and, and you know, we've chatted about this before, so you kind of know what I'm going to say on the private, the private equity side. Mm -hmm. you, you can't see that leverage. Um, private equity, in my mind, has been um, the last four or five years a carousel where it hasn't come to the public markets. There's no kind of more market-oriented validation. It's just been passed. And, and it's a great game if, you know, I run a fund and somebody else buys it off me. That's my carry in the bag. I'm on to my next one. Um, but a lot of these businesses retire, require continuous funding. And because um, I'm not at cash flow positive levels yet. And, and I think what will happen is, is what always happens, but different this time from the, the last time, is that um, the private equity firms will have to sustain the cash flow of the business in which they're invested, which means they won't invest in anything else. Um, you know, the bounce back after um, the financial crisis was sufficiently rapid that it, and the lag in valuations, it didn't show up, not this time. So I think you've already seen some sizable markdowns, but that, that's only just, just beginning. And, and I think a lot of the capital that's been pushed in there from public funds, they're, they're going to find pension funds with all sorts of issues because of it. Yeah, it's really interesting because what is in your book is that the banking system is probably okay. I mean, I agree yeah. with that as well. Yeah. So it's really interesting. And I just read it. It's uh, as a policy response of old, however, this rationale has become less and less easy to defend. Unlike the 1930s, there's been no outbreak of smoot holly type protectionism. We might come back and discuss that. Yeah. Uh, nor any strangulation of liquidity by gold standard related exchange rates. Bank balance sheets have been recapitalized and in fact have rarely looked stronger. So if we're going to see this debt problem, it's going to be outside the banking system, isn't it? And, yeah. and where do you think that's going to be without mentioning any specific names live on air? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would... Um, yeah, actually, one of the lecturers in the, the course that you set up, I think Peter Warburton is, is very good at the financial plumbing of the non-bank sector. Um, it's not an area that's well understood, but the, the, you don't need to be in a bank to create credit, if you like, because of all these instruments. And I think you're going to find that there's um, a whole bunch of holders of these instruments who bought them to get the yield, who are going to find that not only do they not get the yield anymore, they're going to have to write them down. And that's going to cause a whole bunch of issues. So it's going to be one of, you know, so if I think, if you think to the financial crisis, and I thought this, I thought, um, I thought both um, the book um, and the film about the financial crisis were, um, I mean, I think Michael Lewis is a, just an inspired writer, um, and um, I really enjoy reading his, his books. Um, but the, 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 the film, I thought, was interesting in the book, because the, the key element that came out of it was the people that understood how bad it was were the people that were involved with it and helped create it, by and large. And they knew that the stuff was rubbish because they'd helped to build it and then they enlisted somebody else to go. So, you know, I think you're going to find some of those same, same things that the people who really understand where the issues are are the people who were involved with it because it's not in the public domain. It's not listed. You don't have the same um, disclosure requirements. So it's really difficult to pick out anything in particular um, other than the, the, the generality. Um, so you're going to see real problems for pension funds as all this, all this comes down. Um, and the protection that you thought you had of private equity because it performed better in previous downturns, I think, is going to be the opposite this time. So in some ways, it's better for the global economy because if you default on a pensioner, it's better than defaulting on a bank. A bank being a highly geared institution, which doesn't have to take too many losses before it goes bust. 
but this time we're going to be defaulting on pensioners. Well, the answer, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if, the, if you explicitly asked or, implicit, or implicitly asking, you know, who pays for all of this? It's always the same. It's the poor. Hmm. Always the same. And it's, it's uh, in the developed economies, it's the poor. And it's in the poor developed countries, developing countries. It, it just is. It's, it's horrible, but it's the way it the way it unfolds. So anybody on a fixed income is getting eaten away. Inflation really hurts sure. them. Um, there's not going to be room to increase all the um, pension benefits. Um, you know, you look at the US, you know, the path from owning a home to living in a car is a very short one, you know, b because of the lack of a fully funded benefit system, all things go with it. And, um, and, and I, I, I'm, I wish I wasn't saying this, but that's I fear what, what's coming. So, that, so that's where the, the illusion of wealth, you know, the wealth effect for wealthy people, okay, you know, they'll, they'll pull in their horns, but that's not where the real pain is. Which takes us to the kind of key issue on the aftermath, yeah. which is what, what the governments do about it. So I'll just read this bit at the end of the book. Uh, the truth that is, until we know how the authorities will react to the inevitable future decline in equity markets and can form a better judgment about the likely path of inflation and growth in the new conditions, Patience is needed. Who knows, for example, if governments will resort in time to capital and interest rate controls as they did after the end of World War II? Or will they simply let inflation rip? I mean, it's, it, it supposes that the government wants to do this. It wants to transfer wealth away from these savers. I mean, are we looking at something that's happening by accident? Or is this a deliberate policy? This could be to the benefit of debtors, obviously. So are we witnessing things an accident, a great big accident, or will government policy seek to uh, redress this? As you say, that is the big question. It's not the disease that's the question, it's the cure yeah. and the consequences of the cure. So what are your views on the type of cure the governments are likely to, to try and bring to us? So I'm not, I'm not a great conspiracy theorist. I'm, I'm, I'm principally the cock-up theorist <laughs> that most things happen because of institutional structures and the way people react within them. Um, so, um, you know, the difficulty for a government, I mean, you don't want to be in government now, you don't want to be trying to solve this because you can't, or, or in what, what's coming. You, you want to be coming in later once it's solved and then try and obviously take, take, <laughs> take the credit for it. Um, I mean, I think that for me, the way this unfolds is not an inflationary problem, it's going to be a recessionary one. Um, I'm not sure if the orthodoxy has shifted enough to try and move and to try and keep inflation up because you can see the market reaction to it. So I, I, I think you will have more financial repression, but I'm not I'm I'm probably not quite as strong in your view of it. Um, I, I mean I suppose my, my answer is I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure and I'm I'm trying as hard as I can to, if you like, speak to the people who've been in the room. Because a bit like, you know, in my mind how markets are entirely rational and logical, but come to irrational, illogical outcomes in the wider sense. It becomes because of the framework that they're working in and making those decisions. So I, I try to, I'm trying to speak to people who've been involved in those uh, dis discussions. Um, like we're lucky enough to have a dialogue with Nick McPherson, the former uh, permanent secretary, and it's kind of like, well, like what, when you were in the room, what happened? What would your civil servants be doing now if you were there? And they'd be sitting in a room figuring out new taxes, um, and then the tax, you know, the um, and the sort of the same in the U.S. and anywhere else. And then that, that panel of potential taxes will go to the political masters, who will try and figure out which ones are the easiest ones that the population's not going to notice, and then vote me out of office. And then when they're not enough, there'll be more painful, um, more painful ones. Um, so those with the broadest broadest shoulders will come into play, you know, quite quite a lot. Um, but that still doesn't really get you out of it. Um, it it's just, uh, you know, in my mind, a long, painful period because we've been living, if you like, beyond our means for too long. Well, Col I mean, Colbert, who advised Louis XIV, said the secret of successful taxation is like plucking a goose, yeah, yeah. which is removing the most amount of feathers with the least amount of hissing. Yeah, yeah. And inflation achieves that. And we see that in the United Kingdom yeah. today. We see yeah. fiscal creep on a on a 
I wouldn't say spectacular, but a, a much bigger version than I, than I expected yeah. in terms of catapulting people into higher tax bracket, yeah. brackets. Tax receipts are rising quite nicely. No real prospect that we're going to move those tax brackets up, is there? So inflation... You move uh, them up a bit you know, say, and wave your hands, but not enough to make you back to where you started. So Friedman, you know. Friedman said that the only form, the only form of uh, taxation to be imposed without legislation is inflation. So inflation yeah. by itself is getting us some of the way there. It is, and it's obviously deflating the proportion of debt. And, and so the other people that are paying are all the people that own debt. They're still only yielding 3%. Um, and the, the gnomes of Zurich have been away their holidays for a long time, but... They, they make them back. I, I was in Zurich recently. They're smiling in Zurich. Doesn't, <laughs> doesn't happen very often. <laughs> the, uh, I, I mean, there's many interesting bits in the book, but you mentioned that low interest rates tend to lead to de-equitization. Do yeah. you think that the future holds re-equitization? Yeah. I should explain that to people who don't know what this is. So for many years, corporates have been issuing debt and buying back their equity. And for the US, lots of the, the numbers of shares has actually been going down. So yeah. whatever our new world looks like, are we going to have to replace that with equity in the corporate sector? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you, we obviously need to be careful that there are some companies with massive cash balances. Um, so on average, it doesn't look that bad. But when you profile it by the different companies, um, well, uh, so, so the first thing is profit margins are going to come down, I think, because labor costs are going up for all the reasons we, we I think, well, I, be, I believe to be, I was going to say we understand, I'm being a bit, presumptuous saying that we all, we all, we all agree on, on this. But I think if you look at the history of the proportion of returns going to labor adjusted by productivity, so if you like what they should get, um, there were 10 or 15 years where they didn't get it and that's gone to corporate profits. Uh, I, I think they'll start getting some of that, some of that back. So, so margins get, get squeezed, cash flows come down, um, the debt levels are higher than they should be and if I'm a chief executive of, again, you know, if you're in the room, I'm a chief executive, I'll do a, you know, one for four rights issue of some description, then I'll reset my options once it's done. I'm still in business, the business is still running. Um, what else can I do, Mr. Shareholder? You know, this is the world we're in. It's all about survival, and, or I'm, I'm raising money for more growth in the future. Um, so I, I think we get back into meaningful net equity issues. Um, you know, and, and we've seen a little, well, it's hard to pull out the COVID piece, um, you know, which was understandable. There's nothing you could do about that. Taxation, there's a great bit in this about who, where the tax burden is going to fall in the future. Uh, so I'll just uh, read that. The obvious starting point will be to target those groups which appear to be either avoiding their first share of tax or unfairly benefiting from the current environment. In the first category will fall many, many companies that have used the freedom conferred by the reduced need for fixed assets to produce earnings growth and place intangible assets in low tax zones. Uh, you might want to explain what sort of companies they are for those who don't know, uh, how that's done yeah. and how we stop it. I think there's a thing already underway from the OECD to try and yeah. stop this. But it, 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 in other words, if you are running a business with tangible assets, you may be fairly taxed, but maybe the tax burden is going to fall more heavily on other types of companies. That yeah, I think the... I'm trying to remember, probably Apple's the best example in Ireland where it had zero tax because there was a loophole between different tax regimes that allowed that bit of the company not to exist. Um, and you'd I mean, you, you had the oddest, um, sorry, David, <laughs> you had the oddest political position um, where Ireland had been told they were entitled to more taxes and didn't want them. I'm pretty sure the Irish population quality, now, now their <laughs> argument was, we won't get people to come here if our taxes are the same as everybody else's taxes. So, you know, there was a perfectly understandable, understandable reason for it. But the way it works is, um, and Amazon did it in the UK and still does. I mean, Edinburgh Partners wasn't a big firm. We paid more tax in the UK than Amazon. I mean, that, that, because Amazon could put some of its intellectual property into a low tax zone and then charge a license fee for it coming back and forward and paid low taxes. Um, and... Um, and, and so you see, you used to see people like the chief executive of these companies saying, I pay every cent and dollar of tax that I should pay. Uh, the key here is the question of the word should. Um, now, it's, it's legitimate for him to say that because his job is to minimize tax, but it's equally legitimate for um, tax legislation to make sure you don't give them the opportunity to do it. But the problem with that is um, you want, if, you're, if you're Ireland or Luxembourg, whoever it is, 
there's a huge benefit for you, if you're, particularly if you're a small regime, um, because you're not giving up revenues in other businesses, and a small proportion of a large number is huge for you. Um, but there has been a reaction, as, as you say, Russell, for a number of years. Um, and, and like many of these things, I think it will, well, I was going to say, I think it will be led by the US because the US is the most powerful economy in the, in the world. But th there's been a bit of European, because the Americans think the Europeans are going after the, the tax revenues of US IT or, or knowledge-based corporates, which they are. But it's not because they're US and it's not because they're, it's because of the lack of taxation. Um, it, and this is, goes back to, I don't know, it depends what you think you know, happens in the midterms and so forth, whether Biden has the clout to do this because you know, it wasn't one of, in fact, it was the opposite of Trump's priorities. Well, if you want to hear a chief executive uh, exonerating or talking about why it's good to avoid tax, you can listen to Desert Island Disc with Bono. <laughs> where, where he's just explaining the joys of the double dutch sandwich to people who don't know yeah. what it is but uh, the uh, I, i'm going to do ask one more question then we'll throw it open to the floor interest is deductible in the computation of corporation tax across the board really do you think that's another place where we might see some action here with not necessarily banning it but just saying these type of people are allowed to deduct it and these type of people aren't. So for instance, issuing debt to buy back your own shares, maybe you won't be allowed to deduct that interest. Is this a, a mechanism which may be part of whatever the government's have in, in store for us? Well, I think the, the need to raise tax revenues is so pressing, everything's on the table. And the, the main question is, it, it, you know, it's your, your goose getting plucked. Um, how much noise will this do how much money do they give to my re-election campaign? You know, if, if you look at the, you know, the, the, the US and the, the pressure groups for, for, you know, particularly for Congress, that they're very, very influential. But I think such will be the need that they, they won't be able to prevent, you know, a lot of these um, sort of tax codes, uh, be unable to stop some of the tax code changes because you need everything. You know, there's not, um, because your alternative is so politically, un so there's, there's no good outcome, it's just which one hurts me the least. So, so I think it's highly likely that anything, anything that's seen to be immoral is a perfect target. If you get a, a strong political support for doing it, they're going to do it and the rest. Actually, just before we go to the audience, so I'm, I mean, I'm pretty negative on equities in the long run, but I think equities are the place to invest. In this environment, I mean, obviously, you'd have to be very good at picking them. So this is a kind of a lead question for an active manager. But don't you think that amongst this, uh, you know, this long-term decline in equity valuations, that there are equities that can preserve the real purchasing power of wealth? And if it isn't equities, what is it? <laughs> Some equities. Yeah. So um, yeah, I go back. So, so maybe just say what, what I've been doing, because that's, you know, that's the truth rather than kind of a, um, j just words. I think um, there have, there, there, even in the past, so let me go say, I, mean, I get asked by an, an old colleague, um, you know, John Templeton always found something positive to say about something somewhere in one market or another. Um, you know, there must be something. And I think the answer is, I don't know if he would say that if the, the role of money as a mechanism for clearing markets had been suppressed for 13 years. I don't think he would say that. So what do you do in the current circumstances? Well, you want to find something that goes up when markets go down, which is why we put money into, I think, guys outstanding running a long short fund, because there are so many businesses that have been funded that don't have an economic model that works. So this is not, um, well, this is just shorting things whose business model is completely flawed. Now, uh, the thing I have to say here is I can't do that. I don't have the skill set to do that. So the key is finding somebody who does and, and trying to stick what you think you can, you can do. So that's one piece. Um, there are other areas in private markets where they're actually, um, and I, I wouldn't sort of dwell on it um, because it's, it seems counterintuitive, but it's a specific niche where, again, I think things go up and markets go down. And then in equities itself, um, if you believe that there's no recession coming, then there'll be a bunch of equities that might be cheap. But I, and so this is a judgment call. I think a recession is coming, so I don't believe that. Um, I have 
invested in, in equities, the beta of the fund is zero. So it's kind of, but my biggest danger is um, if the markets went up, I'd be, I could actually go down <laughs> because in order to get that, and I'm not sure that the equities I hold at the moment should be in the portfolio for a bit, well, a bit longer, but not that much longer because they were there because I felt it could go up or at least be static or only go down a little in what I thought was unfolding. I think we're a third of the way through it. Um, but when, when we had the call with the people who had a lot of time for about Ukraine, we put some money into defence stocks because they weren't, they were a bit expensive, but not that much, but you could see what would, would happen to them. So there are some pockets, but it's not wholesale yet. Um, and you're right on equities, at least if you, depending on what the, the model is, they should be able to protect themselves a bit from in, in inflation. Uh, so not wholesale yet. Um, I don't think my exposure is going to go up until I see more opportunities coming, but it, it will probably rotate within that. Um, and I'm just, I'm 30% cash. I'm desperate to get it invested, but I have to sit in my hands. So it's, it's, it's somebody asked me a bit about the investment approach. And I said, well, um, you know, it's, it's a bit like a duck. And then I had to spell it, say, I'm getting with a D. Um, I, said, I sit in my hands, there's lots of activity that the paddles are going, but actually there's nothing happening. And it's all the preparation and knowing what you want to buy when it comes in range, but trying to make sure I don't overpay for it. Because this is going to last a while, I think. It's not a quick one. Yep. Okay, well, we shall go to the audience. David has a microphone, so if you put your hand up and have a question, David shall bring you the microphone. Just here. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, you, you talked about getting more flexibility in the uh, mandate for yeah. your investment trust. Yeah. You're clearly not comfortable with shorting. What, what was the extra flexibility you secured? Um, so it, it basically allows us to have higher cash balances. Yes. But higher cash, um, it allows us to go into private equity. But I need to, I mean, I, I, because of what I've said, you think, well, th that's mad, that doesn't make any sense. You've just told me it's all expensive. Um, so, so the investment it has is in a fund um, that finances um, partnerships who are launching their third or fourth fund. The first, if it's, the, the first two or three funds are successful, which is why they're launching the next one. The, um, the partners in these funds want to keep the carry and in return they're hypothecating the revenues of the early funds. So it, it, it's actually um, funding, I think, with a fairly low risk profile on it, but your, your peak is curtailed. It's a niche market because you need to work very hard to do all the due diligence. The banks won't do this anymore. The big firms, it's too much work for what they're, they're getting. They want, you know, it's like Peter said, they want to do the big deals. So that's what it, what it is. So it's not, it's, it's not private equity in the traditional sense. And, and we, we put the money into a fund of somebody we've known for a long time who has these relationships and I think is outstanding. Um, the, the long short fund was the, the second piece. So it's to allow us to do these things in aggregate, to try and get the blend of the portfolio that in the environment we see unfolding either goes down much less or ideally goes up a little bit, which uh, you've got to be careful to strip out the sterling element, but it has gone up a, a little bit. Um, but we needed to get it done last year because the last thing you wanted to do was, you know, expound on all this and then find that you haven't actually got the flexibility to do what you want to do. And then, and then you had to actually be willing to do it <laughs> because, you know, to the extent you're wrong, well, you were, I was already looking like an idiot because I couldn't bring myself to buy lots of stuff. Um, and, and, and as you know, you, you, look, you can look like an idiot for a pretty long time and sometimes you find out you are and sometimes you find out it's just time and neither you nor anybody else really knows until it, until it unfolds. But it, it was, and the trust is, you know, it's, the, the, the argument for the trust is you know, it's a great vehicle for me because it's where my savings are. And, and that's what we're said to the, the, the shareholders that are in it. Any other questions? Do you want to give it to Hamish? And then there'd be one, there's one just behind Hamish as well. Do you see any political parties in crystal-casting the net in regard to pensions? And
I'll just I'll just repeat it because I'm not sure the microphone's working. So Hamish, that's okay. It's not your so uh, anyway. The uh, defined benefit pension schemes of our public servants. Will the government do something about it or not? It will try and chip away at the edges. You know, so um, some of the public sector, the local authorities, have funded pension schemes. So, but but you're right. The vast majority don't. Um, but I, I they, they can't. I just don't think the political they'll have so much on their plate to take that on. Um, I think it's I think it's unlikely. But you know how you calculate the final salary and years of service, it'll be at the margin. I think that's all. Is my guess. I don't. I mean, your judgment's probably better than mine on that, Hamish. Uh, hello. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm curious, uh, thinking about it from the policy perspective, but also. The, the environment for the investor, um, focusing on inflation and more specifically inflationary expectations for the kind of medium to long run. I guess it seems to me... Just, <laughs> just keep going, just you'll be fine, up, I can just hear. Just speak up. So it, it, kind of, it seems to me as though um, in the 19... What kind of got us past the labor unrest and the stagflation of the 1970s and 80s was that you had these kind of helpful supply shocks like the internet that gave us a long period with low inflation and reliable economic growth. And this kind of helped very much the social contract in many of the developed countries. And so what I'm thinking about now is how long will we see actual inflation at 12 per day before we get to a, a state where for the general public the inflationary expectations are on track, could we already be approaching that? And then if so, uh, I mean, thinking about, for example, labor actions that we've seen in Britain, we're seeing it in the airlines. Um, so if we're getting to that, how long before we can get those inflationary expectations back down, and how does that happen? Okay, so... Um so the, do you want to repeat parts of the question? I don't know for the... Yeah, yeah. so the, I mean, the, what the question is really asking at is that it seems to be that the inflation genie is out of the bottle to some extent, that it's got into the wages market and it's becoming more general. And the last time we solved this problem was there were some great big structural tailwinds yeah. that helped with that. I would also add Paul Volcker. Uh, but anyway, uh, when do you think we can kind of get that genie back in the bottle and how does it go back yeah. in the bottle? So um, the benefit we have, which exists at the moment, and I suspect will continue to exist, is that I think Volcker came after um, the breakdown in collective bargaining when the legislation was all changed to prevent you know, the wage round. And, and if you take the UK example in the, the 70s, you know, leading up to the winter of discontent, and so you grew up watching, I think Ford were first, then it was GM, and, and, there was the, and everybody, there was a leapfrogging in, in the wage bargaining and it was collective and then it was the mine workers and um, so then you had the wages and incomes policies. You know, and, and it's, it's interesting to think that there was an environment where governments put ban on what you could give people in their wage increases. You know, and it's, you know, it's not that long ago. So I don't think the legislation will change to allow that to, to come back. Um, there may be a slight um, increase in collective bargaining because I think employers have been much better at using technology to segregate the, the labour force. You know, so if you if you think about, you know, when I grew up thinking that, you know, I'm not, not going to mention number of years, 50 years later or 45 years later, as an employee, you'd be walking around with a GPS attached to you and if you went to the toilet for too long, you'd be fired. I mean, that, that would have, you know... Um, I can't remember who sung it now, but it was a great song called You Don't Get Me, I'm Part of the Union, um, epitomised the, the time. In the so we're not going back to that, I don't think. Um, but the biggest thing that hurt um, wages and labour bargaining, I mean, obviously the, the interest rate regime and the, the economic shock that, that came with it, um, was that with the expansion of the labour force and migration. And those things are going to reverse. So as that happens, 
the pendulum starts to swing back a little bit, which I think is what's happening um, just now. And I think a lot of employees could, could legitimately look at their purchasing power relative to um, what it would have been in, in previous generations. And I think it was hidden a little bit in the early part of the 2000s because of the fall in the cost of consumer items, you know, consumer electronics and all these kind of things. So even if my real wages weren't going up that much, my purchasing power of these kind of products actually actually was. Well, I, I'm not sure we're going to get quite the same level of, of price declines um, anymore because of some of the things that we're, we're seeing um, in, in supplies. You know, so for example, only now is, and I don't know how they resolve it, if you think of um, the US's geopolitical strategic position, they're entirely reliant on Taiwan, the entire military, you know, all the electronic components that are vital for the industrial defense complex are sourced too close to the person you're most frightened of. <laughs> so th that's, th there's going to be all sorts of movements in that, in that direction and none of those things are good for productivity and they're, they're, and they're, they're not good for, um, for wages. But you know, to your question on inflation and the genie and bank in the bottle, um, you know, I, I was surprised why people were surprised when inflation went up because it was simple arithmetic. All you had to do was take what you already knew about the components of the index drop off the previous year, <laughs> put in what it is now and inflation was going up. I mean, um, it was the, simple, the most simplest arithmetic thing in the world to predict that inflation was going to, I mean, I, I thought five, six, seven, but beyond that, not, not so much. But the same thing, you know, unless, for example, unless energy prices go up again the same amount, inflation's coming down just because the, the base effect has, has changed. So, so I, I, I don't know this, this is a guess, but it wouldn't surprise me if we have a period where inflation comes down a bit, the, the kind of, the previous world we were in, the people that were huge advocates of it say, that's great, it's all better now, the Fed can reduce rates, let's have another go at the market, and you get, a, I think we had a little bit of that, we got a chunky rally, but it hasn't removed all the issues. Um, and, and I think from an investment perspective, the last six months has been great, because you've had loads of, you know, if, if you thought things were changing, you've had loads of opportunities to change your portfolio. You know, there's been so much rotation, you've had chances to buy and sell things. Um, so I think, um, I think inflation does come down. I, I, I'm, I'm in the stagflation camp. You know, I think maybe inflation three or four and pretty pedestrian growth, and that, that's what gives you some of the issues. One of the things you mentioned earlier was that the internet had made markets more efficient, more price discovery. That's going to be true for the labour market as well, isn't it? Yeah, now, yeah, if you yeah. remember Norman Tebbett, he said in uh, 1983, get on your bike, you remember yeah. that? So yeah. if you wanted to find a job, you had to get on your bike, cycle around, yeah. knock on doors. And now you get on Google. Yeah. And pretty quickly, by, by putting your CV into Google, you find out what you're worth and you find out whether you can move. Absolutely. And uh, I think this could be a very different labour market. It's very, very tight, assuming it stays somewhat tight. The yeah. ability to shift job and get a higher pay is going to be higher than it's been in any other tight labour market. We haven't really seen a tight labour market for yeah. a very, very long time. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the transmission mechanisms are, in inverted commas, better across the board, but there are consequences. And I just think that there's a kind of residual view that the internet brings prices down, and that was true only at its initial phase. You know, so if you thought, you know, in the early days you would price shop, you'd go to Curry's or Dixon's, and then you'd you'd have your phone if, you, if it was lucky enough to work and you'd figure out what the internet price of it was. Um, you know, we're, we're so far past those days now. Um, it just, so, it, so it, it, it's, it's an, a transmission mechanism in, in all markets now. Yeah, I think it came home to me about five years ago when I went to my local fish and chip shop and he'd bought a price board where the prices were fixed. He couldn't change them. He was so convinced that the price of fish and chips couldn't go up. <laughs> and uh, that seemed to me a... That in terms of inflation expectations, that was when inflation yeah. expectations were so take baked out a futures in. No, contract. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had. It's not, it's not 10 pounds for a fish supper. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Mo well, Martin, you, oh, sorry. We'll, we'll, okay, sorry. Tricky one. Residential, oh, there we go. Residential property prices. So in in DMs, basically. So the major cities. So it feels to me of all, of all the asset prices, 
of all the asset prices that we've seen major inflation from, that is certainly one of the, you know, biggest beneficiaries. And it feels like there's a number of things to kind of comment on just with regards to, you know, valuation across a whole load of metrics. Um, and then affordability, certainly for maybe not my general well, my generation, but also the next generation. So I'm I'm interested to get your steer on what will burst the bubble and whether there may be a policy response to stop the inevitable kind of strains in society that that would cause. There are strains in society without that happening because yeah. people won't be able to afford uh, properties. Then the system might need to change its rules to allow that. You might need to create new homes. People may need to relocate to different countries. But sorry, lots of different questions. Yeah. The, the only one really one is, do you think residential property prices will correct? And if so, what would be the trigger? Well, the obvious tr trigger is the financing cost of people in variable mortgages. And, and they just find that they can't afford um, and, and the banks have been pretty strict until recently on uh, loan-to-value ratios. So, um, I mean, normally what happens is prices don't move, you just don't transact. You know, so you're in your house, it's too expensive, and you have to sit there for 10 years because you can't afford to buy one and you can't afford to sell it because of the various, uh, well, because of the debt you've got on it, because you've been negative equity. So, um, and that's not good for the labour markets because you get stuck and you, you can't afford to... Um, you can't afford to do anything. I think the, and not that I'm trying to be a politician or a, a policy, but you know the, the biggest issue in housing is, as we all know, the lack of build. You know, and, and I would have, and and the, the simplest policy to address it is make put a hundred rounds, hundred yards around all cities. Decrease the green belt by hundred yards in every city. Allow people to build. Um, as a council, take the planning gain for changing your know, compulsory purchase. Um, change the use of the land and get houses being more affordable because it's artificial. It's the planning constraints that cause it to, to you know, the, in my mind, the, the, the family homes. The problem with that is it makes other prices come down and they're typically the people that vote for you. So it's, it's that, kind of, um, that kind of dilemma. So I think it will be very similar to what it's been traditionally is that you'll get, you'll get stagnation um, and prices will eventually fall, but you, there'll be so few transactions you won't be able to know what the true underlying price is. Martin, you get the honour of the last question of the evening. Oh, gosh, what an honour. <laughs> um, well, one of my favourite economic quotes is very simple, yet very profound. The late Herb Stein, the US economist, said, if something's unsustainable, it will stop. Yeah. Lovely, simple concept. Yeah. So you look at the trend in public sector debt, it seems to be unsustainable. Wartime levels of debt have been yeah. We point that yeah. out. Um, we can't tax our way out of that. I mean, you, you said, said you saw a recessionary outcome, but yeah. recessions, public debt goes up, not, not down. It can't be a recessionary outcome. That's what actually makes well, things worse. Hang on, let, yeah. let me finish my thought. I don't see how you can expect politicians to deal with this because raising taxes, cutting spending is not popular. Don't expect the voters to want it either because they're the beneficiaries of all the low taxes and increased spending. So who disciplines? Where do the discipline fiscal trends come from in financial markets? The only policemen out there on fiscal behaviour are financial markets. And every country that's hit the debt wall, whether it's New Zealand in the mid-80s, Canada in the early 90s, the Scandinavian countries, it's all come through financial markets, specifically the bond market. James Carville, you know, Clinton's advice, if he wants to come back in afterlife, he'll come back as the bond market so he can intimidate everyone. But bond investors, they know these trends in public debt as much as you, well, more than we do. I mean, that, they, they focus on that. They don't care. If the bond market doesn't care about fiscal trends, why should governments care? Why should voters care? So what is going to bring the financial policeman out of the cop well, I think um, to say that bond markets don't care and won't care indefinitely is to say the laws of economics don't apply. I'm saying they don't care now. I'm asking yeah. you, when will they care? Well, I think they've they started care? caring. I think they've started caring. I think they were willing to live with the myth of sub-2% inflation indefinitely, but you can't live with that myth when it's sitting in front of you. Um, so it's very hard to justify buying a bond now where you're locking in a loss. 
so that expectation changes it. Um, you know, I, I, the bit I was got coming in on in the recession was it's not, under, it's not in their control to say whether they want a recession or not. That's not, it's not a policy decision. Obviously, it's an outcome. And, um, and I think, the uh, this is just personal opinion, I think the seeds of the recession are already with us. I, I, I don't, I, you know, and, and I fully accept this, it's just a personal view, but when I look at it, and, and, and you're right, it's conditional upon the view that interests you. And, and I don't really care when, because I, I, you know, I, I fully accept, I can't predict exactly when, I couldn't predict when this started. I just felt it was coming, which is why I rushed to get the book to try and think it all through, because uh, there's no writing it. And then, and, and, and I was writing it because, oh God, don't let it happen yet. Let me get this finished. You know, I'm seven chapters in, and it's so, oh no. Um, but, 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 I, but I think the rationality is recovering, and, and that's because we have run out of road. You know, you can't have eight trillion on the Fed balance sheet and say we can put another eight billion, eight trillion on it, because there's no buyers for that that money. So I think, I think the the buy and sell disciplines have brought you to the position where you, you can't suggest to people you'll make money out of bonds by buying them, given where inflation is. So the only way you can make them buy them is force them to buy them. That's a big ask. I, I think we've just opened a whole can of worms right at the very yeah, end. Yeah, I know, Russell. <laughs> See, Russell said last question. So, so I dropped a hand grenade next to him and then he has to stop. We have to stop. Uh, and, and everybody in this audience needs a drink after that as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Sandy, Sorry about that, guys. Uh, thanks for cheering everybody up. Uh, the book is uh, was in this library if you'd like to come here and read it, but I'm sure Sandy would prefer if you bought one. Uh, no, don't um, worry. Uh, you, you've heard it all. There's nothing so, left. So uh, anyway, here we are at the Library of Mistakes. This is our last uh, lecture before the summer. I'm delighted you could join us. Please stay for drinks. And please uh, join me in thanking Sandy in the usual way. Thank you. And, and as this is being live streamed, I should add one thing. Uh, the Library of Mistakes received a donation not long ago of some books. And as we were looking through the books, we discovered that one of them uh, was written by a man called John Law, who some of you will know is the man who bankrupted France. Whether he did it deliberately or accidentally is still debated, but he did. Uh, this is the first edition, 1705 copy. And uh, because we are really about learning, we have put it up for auction. So if you'd like to buy it, uh, it is, I think the range is 6,000 to 9,000 pounds. Uh, it's at Lyon and Turnbull. But I'm saying this because it's live streamed and I know there's lots of hedge fund, <laughs> hedge fund managers watching. So if you want to buy a first edition, John Law, on the 13th of July, Lyon and Turnbull, this is your chance to own a bit of Scottish and French history. Uh, and now it's... Um, and uh, because it's being live streamed, we're also running the course, the Practical History of Financial Markets. Uh, in its online version, known as the Advanced Valuation in Financial Markets. So you can also take that online. And if you want to take it in person, we're in London, 11th, 12th, and 13th of October. Here ends all of the adverts for the activities <laughs> of the library. Can I just say one thing, to, well? one thing to finish? Um, th th this hall is, is fantastic, and it's entirely down to everything that Russell has done to do. And, and I think... One of the things that's always annoyed me was Scotland boasting about its financial history but doing nothing to actually try and create its future. And I think this place is going to be really important. And um, I just think, I think it's a fabulous facility and congratulations to you, Russell, for creating it. And free drink.